Hello and welcome to today's devotion. We are in the Gospel of Luke chapter 6 and today we're starting with verse 27. As we go through this chapter and go through the various teachings that Jesus taught as he advanced the kingdom. These are teachings that Luke has thought out quite, uh, quite diligently. The Beatitudes that we looked at last week are also found, by the way, in Matthew um, the blessings are also found in, in, uh, John as well. Um, but today we're going to be looking at verse 27. So let's pray and let's go into the word. Lord, thank you for your word and for your faithfulness in revealing it to us. There are times in which we have read your teaching, have heard your teaching, have even heard pastors give sermon after sermon on your teaching and yet not quite got the full extent or understood the full extent of what it meant. And it's not until you, through your spirit, bring us through certain certain circumstances and the timing is right that you reveal the deeper meanings of your teaching. So wherever we may be, if we are beginning to hear this, your teaching for the first time or have heard this for maybe even decades, May we grow in our awareness of the depth of your truth as you reveal that truth to us. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 27, Jesus says these to his disciples. Now remember, verse 20 states, then looking up at his disciples, he said, these are not teachings that are what we have in our culture life coach teachings, inspirational teachings. These are not that. Are they life? Are they meant to, to add to one's life? For sure. But a life coach is somebody that you hire because you think they can inspire you or work through a, a block in your life or a hang up in your life or something of that nature. And there certainly may be some benefit to that. But this is not that. This is teaching that you build your life upon. It is the foundational teaching for one's life. It is the teaching that comes and is revealed regarding the truth of it only through discipleship, not through consumership. You don't buy it. You don't take a seminar and do a weekend retreat in order to learn the mysteries of it. God reveals it to us individually and collectively in his own time, in his own way, and in his own methods. As such, as disciples then, that want to know the kingdom, that have pledged ourselves to learning of the kingdom, he says in verse 27, but I say to you who listen, love your enemies. Do what is good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Stop. Two verses need some unpacking. The first is, I say to you who listen, love your enemies. Put a pause right there. Our culture has no idea what the word love means. We assume it has everything to do with emotions. And while emotions may be part of it, that is not what constitutes love. Love is the will for good and the commitment to the good of another. You might not even like the other, but you can love the other. And if it's based on emotion, you will never love another person the way Jesus is referring to with regards to the enemies, because you'll never have the warm, fuzzy, hallmark feelings that we associate in our culture with love. It has nothing to do with it. If someone is my enemy and I have it, enemies, okay, doing good to them simply may mean not talking with them, not engaging with them. That's 
for their good, that's for my good, that's for the ultimate good. If they are in need, I may help them even, because that would be for their good. But it's not dependent on feelings or emotions. So when Jesus says, love your enemies, he follows it with, do what is good to those who hate you. He doesn't say, conjure up warm feelings. He says, do what is good for those who hate you. So if they hate you, maybe the good is just to walk away. Maybe the good is not to gossip about them. Maybe the good is simply to hold your tongue and not curse them or harm them or lash out at them. Maybe that is the good. The restraining of revenge may be the good. Whatever the case may be, it's the exact opposite of our natural instinct to get even. To get even is not for their good. It is for us to exact or extra, uh, to, to exercise rather revenge. And that is not for their good. So this is important to understand. Because if you're thinking that you have to have these warm, fuzzy feelings, that will never happen. And that's not what love is anyway. He goes on to say, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Now, we don't know how to bless. We know how to bless in terms of um, having people that are dear to us. But blessing our enemies is a foreign thing to do. And blessing them may simply be releasing them into God's presence and God's providence so that you don't feel like you have to be the one to bless them. The blessing may be simply turning them over to God so that God can do what God's going to do in their lives. And you don't feel like you have to be the one to step in. Now, it may, it may be that you are called to help someone who is your enemy or to bless someone in a more tangible way. That's fine too. But it's not a cookie cutter way. There is no cookie cutter methodology to this thing. It is a spirit-led endeavor. And then he says, pray for those who mistreat you. Pray and do not plot revenge. And many times the prayer that I've had for those who have mistreated me is simply to lift them into God's presence and release them so that there's no room for me to entertain revenge. He goes on to say, if anyone hits you on the cheek, offer the other also. Hmm. If anyone takes away your coat, don't hold back your shirt either. Give to everyone who asks you and from someone who takes your things, don't ask for them back. Just as you want others to do for you, do the same for them. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. Now, let's just take a, a pause. This is not a legalistic command. It's not a law. What is it? It is a teaching. It is a spiritual posturing. For example, if anyone hits you on the cheek, offer the other also. If someone, if someone hits me, strikes me on the cheek, my implementation of this may simply be to refrain from striking back. Or perhaps... What God is actually calling me to do is to strike them down so they can't strike anyone else. The point being, though, is that you're not extracting revenge. It's not a rule. If someone comes up and they are a violent person and they hit me, it may be God's will that I turn around and take them out and flatten them on the floor so that they do not hurt any other person. Or that they do, they, now that's only if God leads you to do that. When Jesus was, was um, on trial and was hit in the face repeatedly, he did not strike back. He offered the other. On the other hand, when there were times in which it was called for, Jesus would at least 
with regards to the form, overturn their tables in the temple. Jesus never harmed, though. He didn't have to. And if he, if, if, if there was a time in which he was looking at his enemies and it, he understood they were spiritual in nature and not human in nature. He understand that his advancement of the kingdom was spiritual and that many times they were using human beings as pawns. But for us as disciples, this is a spiritual posturing. All right. The same is true for verse 30. Give to everyone who asks you and from someone who takes your things, don't ask for them back. It's another example of spiritual posturing. If someone asks you, or in this case, give to everyone who asks you, well, if that was the case, you'd be poor. Because as soon as people learn that that's what you're going to practice, they'll ask you and you'll have to give it to Again, it's not a law. It is a spiritual principle. It is wisdom. It is a posturing. Now, with regards to prayer, um, spiritual pos- posturing starts with prayer. So, for example, when people come in, frequently people will come to the church in need of something. I don't have a set policy to just give away everything that's here because they ask. I immediately go into prayer. And I'm not perfect. I'm sure I've given to people who have misused the gifts that I've given them. And I'm sure there may have been times where I withheld when people were in need. I don't know. But I seek the Lord and I always feel confident to a degree that at least I've done the best. I don't trust in my best, but I've done the best in seeking the Lord in distributing to those who need according to his will. Primarily, what Jesus is doing in these verses is transforming people into into becoming a conduit for God's will. Not a conduit for revenge, not a conduit for payback, but a conduit for God's will. That's ultimately what this is about. And especially in a world which functions off of revenge and getting even, this takes a complete different route. Okay, there's more to it, but at this point in time, we're going to leave it at this, understanding that these are not easy teachings to, to, to become uh, a regular practice. These are teachings that are constantly being set before us as we are being transformed into the kind of people that naturally do them. And the focus is on spiritual transformation in becoming the kind of people that naturally exhibit this as compared to turning this into a legalism in which we're trying to perform too. Well, that's what I have for today. Thank you so much for for tuning in. Um, I pray that today's devotion was meaningful to you. And I look forward to sharing more of the word next time when we get together. Until then, when the peace of God be with you, I'll see you next time.